Welcome to Guest and Gusto, SCAD's virtual series of conversations and digital content with the creators and innovators remaking culture. I'm Alpha Tyler, and I'm happy to introduce Emmy-nominated actor and playwright William Jackson Harper. William Jackson Harper is most notably known for his portrayal of Cheaty in NBC's Emmy-nominated comedy series, The Good Place and earned an Emmy nomination for Outstanding Supporting Actor in a Comedy Series. The Good Place is critically acclaimed and has won a Peabody Award and the AFI Award for TV Program of the Year. The show has also received nominations for Best Comedy Series by the Emmys, Golden Globes, and Critics' Choice Awards. For two consecutive years, William received a Critics' Choice Award nomination for Best Supporting Actor in a Comedy Series. Clearly, his work is beloved, and we are thrilled to have him with us today. So, okay, now it is time for our poll question. And today, you have the chance to win the Good Place DVD set, seasons one and two. So, here we go. The question is, which one of William's roles is your favorite? Electric Company, They Remain, The Good Place, Dark Waters. So after the conversation, we'll have a brief moment to talk to William and you can ask a few questions. So please have your questions ready. And here we go. All right. <clears throat> Thank you so much for being here. Thanks <laughs> for having me. Uh, one of the things my introduction did not include was that you, you're currently in Los Angeles, but you reside in Brooklyn with your dog, Chico. So how is Chico after taking him to the dog psychic? That's what I want to know. <laughs> he's, uh, he's, he's fine. He's asleep in the corner right now in his little sunspot. Um, yeah, he's he's great. It was actually really useful to talk to the animal communicator because uh, we just couldn't figure out why he wasn't himself. And now he's, you know, he's back to being him. So it, it, it's he's, he's great. He's great. That's awesome. So speaking of psychics or communicators, no one could have predicted everything that's happened in 2020. And one of the things in my research and the things that I learned about you is that I admire the fact that as a man whose passion is storytelling, you really use your voice to speak out about social justice issues, including the Black Lives Matter movement, but also in support of the fair wage on council so that artists can really support themselves in their work. Um, in my Art of the Audition film and TV class, my students actually have an assignment called Actor, Activism, and Politics. Um, it's conveniently due after the presidential election. <laughs> what would you change, um, what change would you like to see and, and what motivates you to be so actively involved? Well, um, you know, I... Uh... You know, I, I'm not sure that I'm as active as I feel I, I should be. Um, you know, it's uh, it, it takes very little effort uh, to, to send out a couple of tweets and to, you know, make your opinions known on Instagram and, and whatever. But, um, you know, I, uh, I do feel that I, I have a little bit of a platform and I do have opinions just as a citizen. And I think that when it comes to Fairway John Council, um, I, I really do feel like artists for what is required of them should earn a living wage. I, I just think that, you know, it's not, this isn't a hobby. This isn't a thing that we just do for fun when it fits into our schedules. It's like in order to, especially when it comes to being an actor and in particular a stage actor, um, this take, it takes over your life. So you're in rehearsal six days a week. Uh, between six and eight hours a day and then you're in performance and when you're doing you know you're in performance or in, and when you're in performance in the early part you're in preview so you're rehearsing all day then performing at night and you're doing that eight nights or eight shows a week and six nights a week and so it's 
you know, it, 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 it's only fair that people make a wage that they can sustain themselves on, given that there is no room to do other things when you're actually involved in the production. And, you know, it's like, it's also one of those things where, unless you're in like some super long running Broadway show, that job is going to end, you know, it, it's going to stop after like, you know, tops usually like two months. So you're back, you're back to, um, you know, you're just, you're sort of back on the grind, back trying to find a job again. And that's, I mean, that is part of what the journey is, but I do think that it, 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 we, we, I think we lose a lot of people in the industry because of the realities of it. And I think that, you know, I, I, you, we wind up having a lot of people, I think, like this, in my case, like I actually stopped doing theater because I was like, I, this is starting to just make me mad. You know, I'm tired of working all the time and being broke anyway, um, working like a professional. So I just think that it's something that, that needs to be rectified. And there are some steps that are actually, you know, moving us, that are being taken, that are moving us toward that goal of earning a living wage. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> it's interesting that you, that you said that because I, I tell my students, you want to do television and film so that you can afford to do theater. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> sadly, that's what it is. And I think that, um, you know, like Broadway wages can be very good. And, um, you know, and it's, it's, you can, you can survive on that in New York City. But, you know, when I was doing a lot of off-Broadway plays, uh, which is, that was the cool work that I wanted to do. That was like this, the plays that I grew up on, the plays that made me want to be an actor. Very few of them were big Broadway productions. They were really cool off-Broadway shows that sort of make the rounds in the regional theater circuit and around colleges and, um, if you're doing those plays, it's, uh, it, you, you don't make enough to, to live in New York City. You just don't. Um, it's, it's just a, it's a really tough place to, to survive in. So I, I think given that you'll see an actor's face all over the place on posters and on, you know, in, in the New York Times and, um, and stuff like that. It's, it, it's only fair that an actor is able to afford to go see themselves in the play that they're performing in. You know, it's like, Absolutely. that's, you know, that's, I think that's, that's fair. And if the wages that we're earning can't even allow us to go and be passive participants in our own art form, then something's off. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Well, you have an incredible theater background, including your 2014 Broadway debut in All the Way with Brian Cranston. And actually this past November, I was in New York um, for the Broadway debut of my former student, SCAD alum Burke Swanson, who was in the Rose Tattoo with Marissa Tomei. I would love for you to share with us how you adjust your performance from stage to screen and if your preparation changes based on the performance medium that you're in. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, the thing about plays and the reason why I love them so much is there is a lot of rehearsal and discovery and trying to find that um, inevitable yet surprising way to get to where the play is going. Um, and it's also, it's also as an actor, it's a, it's a far more interactive thing for me um, to just be in charge of that experience that the audience is having once the lights go up. Um, you know, you're you're just you're on that train and you're just riding it. And it's good feedback. So, yeah, it's <laughs> your feedback. You know, if the joke is working, you know, if the audience is with you. Um, you know, you ignore it, but you, it's like you can you you know you're 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 sort of you're, you're you feel you're, the presence. You feel the presence. <laughs> And, and that's, that's a lot of, I, I love that. And I love doing long bits of things. You know, I think that, you know, typically on camera, do really small snippets. So it's like a minute here, two minutes there, like three or four minutes is a pretty long scene for, uh, for TV or for film. And, and then it's gonna be edited up. And then it's the end of the day up. anyway. You do it from different angles. You do just little pieces that's of right. things. And there's also just very limited rehearsal. 
you know, you basically do all your prep work on your own and you just come in and you run it yeah. once or twice and then you go away and then you come back and you shoot it and you just try different things. But, um, and out of sequence as well. And, yeah, out of sequence. So yeah, like you may, I mean, there's been times where I've shot uh, very heightened scenes with a whole lot of backstory before it uh, very early on in the process. And so it's, so there's a lot of homework. The, the homework you do is very different. You know, it's, it's a lot of solitary stuff. And, you know, you, you try to just imagine where you are. Whereas with the play, it's, uh, you know, it's a lot more, you're, you're going to go through this thing chronologically. And, you're, and even if things are broken up and told out of sequence, you've rehearsed the play long enough that it's in your bones. Mm -hmm. And I find that sometimes for me, when I'm working on camera, um, it, start, it, it starts to get into my bones as we do it, rather than having something that's in my bones by the time anyone is seeing it. Um, and then also the other thing is just, um, you know, stage, you have to be heard. You have to be seen by people that are far away from you. And so there's a, there's a size to the performance that's very different. Um, and I think that I had a professor say to me that sometimes what helped him when he was working on camera was to take all of that work that you would do on stage and just put it behind a veil, just make it smaller, just make it more contained. It can be a little more intimate, sometimes so intimate in a way that it doesn't feel real when you're doing it. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, just putting it behind a veil and that's what the camera will, will catch and, and render it in a way that it feels very real. So um, that took some getting used to for me because I'm, I've, you know, until the last couple of years, hey. I was pretty, pretty big guy. <laughs> Speaking of, of that, do you have any vocal warm ups or any kind of uh, vocal exercises, even physical exercises that you like to do prior to a performance that also helps maybe with nerves and to get you into the right headspace of a particular character that you're playing? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, um, you know, I, I, for me, it's usually very physical. Um, because I have a lot of energy that will try to uh, dissipate in the scene in a way that's not useful, you know? <laughs> so um, like, for instance, I, I know that when I'm not physically sort of centered uh, on camera, I tend to blink a lot, uh, which is like a weird thing that I think a lot of actors have, 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 I've told this to people and they're like, oh yeah, I do that too. And it's like, oh yeah, this is, a way to sort of just sort of dissipate the nervousness, just to, you know, sort of like reset in a way. And yourself and, into the present. Yeah, and, and so I find that physically I have to get myself to a place where I feel very warm and a little tingly and settled. Mm -hmm. And then I can just be there. And it's also a matter of, uh, you know, maybe even being a little afraid of the camera because it just feels very artificial when you're doing this yeah. thing and then there's several people in the room just over there and then there's this like this piece of machinery in your face it's really easy to just sort of be just conscious of the fact that this isn't real and they're also very close and what are they catching and you know it, it's it's easy to sort of get nervous um whereas on stage it's uh you know, the lights go down, you kind of can't see the audience or you kind of can, but it doesn't really matter because you're on a train that's just moving and going in one direction. Right. And so, um, so yeah, it's usually it's, it's a physical thing, but then also for the stage stuff, I have to do vocal warm up just because it's, I, I don't want to blow my voice out. Um, and I, on camera, I also find that some sort of, Articulators warm up, warm up is is very useful um, because the like words. My are... students hate when I do the the um, the what do you call those little rhymes and and things of that nature. They can't stand them, but they really are very useful. They're super <laughs> useful. They're, they're super useful, especially I mean, especially when I was playing Chidi. It was you know I was I had some I had some word burgers. I had some seriously <laughs> intense pieces of text to get through and if I wasn't ready to do it and I wasn't warmed up it would just it would just take me a while to kind of get into the in, into the zone 
exactly. Um, you are a playwright and uh, your debut play is Travis Bill, which opened to critical acclaim. I would love to hear and to share with our audience, what was it about this particular story that was so important for you to tell? Because this is um, based on an actual real event that occurred, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I, it, it's, it's, it's more inspired by just because, and I don't want to pass it off as, as history because I yeah. basically take the germ of the story and then just go completely out in the left field with a lot of things. But uh, I was really interested, I grew up in Dallas and I was always really interested in, in the fact that Dallas never really had any sort of civil rights upheaval. And I was wondering why that was, because it was a Southern city, it was segregated. And I remember asking my mom, like, was it like this? You know, I re watching the eyes on the prize as a kid, this documentary, I remember watching that. And I, I asked her, you know, like, was it like this when you were little? And she's like, I don't really remember it being this way at all. I mean, like, I'm sure it was. I remember, I, I, mean, I remember segregated bathrooms and stuff like that, but you know, it was just the way it was, but it wasn't really, you know, all this other stuff that wasn't really here. And I thought that was really interesting. And um, there was this book called The Accommodation by this journalist named Jim Shoots. And uh, it sort of unpacks what all that was about. And I thought it was really interesting to, to, to look at the civil rights movement, not as a series of confrontations, but as a series of decisions being made to keep confrontation from happening. Mm -hmm. And the and 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 just what people are are willing to allow in order to to stay safe, to to um, to to keep the peace. Uh, and and so it, uh, that's sort of what it was about. And and uh, and, and in the in, in the in the actual story, it was really this. Um, there was a project to displace a lot of residents in this area around our fair park, the state fair park, uh, to make room for a parking lot. Mm -hmm. And people were getting their houses demolished and they were getting bought off. And, you know, they were basically paying white people twice what they were paying black people simply because they were white. And, and it was about that fight. Uh, that, that's what the, you know, that's what inspired it. And I just thought there was just so many interesting voices and so many interesting points of view um, as to why people were willing to allow it to happen, why people felt it should happen, why people felt that they were entitled to certain things. And I just, it, it, it's, it, it was just endlessly interesting to me. And so it just got a lot of ideas cooking for me. And um, I also just wanted to break down the idea of, you know, black people in the civil rights movement being a monolithic thing. There was a lot of differences of opinion and uh, and a lot of disagreement on what the correct pathway forward was. Sure. And I really wanted to sort of dive into that a little bit and see people really get angry with each other because of, the, you know, they want a similar thing, but the ways they want to go about it are very different and that can cause some really huge conflicts. Definitely. How long did it actually take you to complete the, the play? I would imagine you were in the process of working on other projects at the time. Like how, how did you start the process and how long was it? And, and how did you find the time? Because you weren't in a COVID situation when you wrote it. So how yeah. did you find the time to even sit down to be able to, to write it? it well, it took, it took years before the uh, actual production happened. I, um, I feel like I wrote the first draft pretty fast. It was, uh, I, I started it at this uh, writer's retreat where I was working as an actor, actually. And we were allowed to go to some of the writer's workshops. And I, I you know, just attended some of these things and had this idea and decided to start breaking the script down or breaking down the idea into, you know, sections and trying to figure out how I wanted the story to go. And um, so I started it there and I think I finished it within uh, two months or so, the first draft, and I, and I gave myself a deadline because I actually applied for this, uh, uh, this, this festival where the, of this theater that I'm a member at, 
where you could basically do whatever you wanted to do for a night in the theater. And I was like, okay, well, oh. I'll give myself a deadline. I'm going to try to finish this play and get a reading together. And so that sort of, you know, lit the fire under my ass and made me go. And, uh, and so I, I finished it, finished that first draft then, but then I went through years of rewrites and different workshops and stuff. So from beginning to end, it was about eight years, I want to say, um, before it actually wow. came to the stage. Eight years. Uh, yeah. That is it, a it, of love. Yeah. Oh, it was, oh. <laughs> yeah. It, it was one of those things, though, where it was the, the, a, lot, a lot of things happened. Some of it was, I wasn't working on it consistently. I would like, do it. We do a little workshop. I get some notes. I address those notes. And then it would go back on the shelf for another year or two or three in some cases. And so, you know, it was just sort of like doing the work on it putting it away, doing the work on it, putting it away. And then finally- Having some life, <laughs> going back to it. Yeah, exactly. Adulting, <laughs> yeah. going back to it. <laughs> Something like that, yeah. <laughs> exactly, yeah. that's great. Well, see, and, and that really, and that I think really encourages other people, other artists who are working on projects and they think that it's supposed to happen within a short period of time or, you know, by this particular day, and you have to just let go and allow the process to unfold the way it's going to, because look, at the end of the day, you have a terrific play that, um, you know, that now the world can end up seeing. So the point yeah. is to just keep moving along forward with it, regardless of whatever else tends to get into the way, because yeah. something else will always come up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's just going to be what it is. Um, you know, some people can write quickly and, you know, a lot of things go right and their play gets done very, very fast, you know, but, um, you know, I'm not primarily a writer, uh, you know, like I'm primarily an actor and I just had an idea that I wanted to chase down. And so, you know, for me, it was something that was, um, yeah, it was, I was doing it because I wanted to be doing it, not because I was like actively trying to be, you know, a multi-hyphenate artist. It was just, right. I, I, this is a thing I wanted to see if I could, see if I could finish it. And, you know, fortunately I, I got to the end of it. That's fantastic. Well, you do do quite a bit of work, including audio books. And uh, I know that you've narrated numerous audio books and it was announced just last month that you're going to narrate Marvel's Black Panther, Sins of the King, which will release on Serial Box in January of 2021. So yeah. I would just love to know from you, what does this project mean to you? Because I know that you're a huge sci-fi fan. So um, what does it mean that you will now get to narrate this series? Uh, it means a lot. Um, you know, Black Panther, I remember seeing it in the theater and just wishing that this existed when I was a kid, just because I feel like, I don't know, maybe it's just me. I just felt like black folks were never invited to the future or to space. <laughs> and I, and I, we're I was, always uh, in the past. We're always in the past. Always in the pa deep always past. Deep past. It was like, <laughs> like, you know, it's just like, yeah, we didn't make it. You know, and I'm like, oh man, it's like, it, it, it always irked me and always made me feel bad. And I always felt like, you know, like, for some reason, like we had no place in those worlds. And um, and so seeing it, it, I mean, I remember just actually getting really emotional because being such a huge fan of sci-fi and, and of being a, a big comic book fan as a kid, um, you know, I, 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 I just, I, I, I just thought of all the kids that were gonna, this was gonna be their entrance into the medium, mm -hmm. you know? And that, you know, and it's kids for, it's not even just, just black kids. I mean, like all kids are going to see this world in which black people are invited and black people are carrying the story and doing all the cool stuff. And, you know, it's like, it's really, I love it when I see little white kids that want to be Black Panther for Halloween. I think that's great, you know, it's, <laughs> and so it's, um, I, it's, yeah, so like, in, in general, the character just means a lot to me, and getting to do this project um, is, it's amazing. I mean, you know, it's, um, it's something that I, 
I, I've always wanted to be involved in, in that world in some way. Um, and so getting to do this is, is great. And it's also, it's, it's, a, it's a killer story. I'm about midway through uh, recording it now. And okay. um, I'm, I'm just like, I'm, I, I'm, I just, I'm, I'm just, <laughs> I want to know what happens next. So it's, I mean, the writing on, on, on this project is incredible. And so I just, I, I just want to be as good as the words. And so that's, yeah, it means a lot. It just means a lot to be involved. That's fantastic. Now, I understand that during quarantine, you were actually working on an audio play. Are you at liberty to share a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. Um, it was something for Williamstown Theater Festival. Um, they're basically doing all of their plays uh, of this season because of the pandemic with, uh, with Audible. And wow. so we uh, rehearsed this play uh, remotely and we recorded it remotely, <laughs> which is, which is nuts, um, because I, I find the play very kinetic. Um, but it's a, it's a play called Animals by Stacey Osei Kafour. Uh, it was directed by Whitney White. And it's a, it's a play about race and relationships and old friends and new enemies. And it all takes place over a dinner uh, uh, up in, uh, up in basically Washington Heights. And it's a, uh, mm -hmm. It's a really great forehander and it's really intense. And we go to some really dark places, which I wish we were able to be in the room to do that sure. together. Um, but I, 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 you know, I think that because it's such a verbal play, it will translate to uh, the audio format pretty effectively. Awesome. Well, I know that you just finished production on Barry Jenkins' Amazon Limited series, The Underground Railroad, which will premiere in 2021. And uh, it was filmed in and around Savannah and different locations. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually one of our SCAD grads, MK Smith, was in the first episode. So that's always exciting wow. that we're able to get our students involved in actual professional productions. Um, would you tell us a little bit about your character Royal and what can we expect from the series? Uh, <laughs> well, um, you know, the series, um, it's based on the book and I'm not, I'm not sure if anyone's read the book, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a harrowing story. Um, you know, it's basically what if the Underground Railroad was an actual train that moved, you know, <laughs> underground. And it's, um, but everything else is, uh, is very real. I mean, it, it, everything else is, it, it really unpacks how monstrous slavery was. And um, like, not, not only physically, but also psychologically mm -hmm. and what it does to people. And, and it's, um, I, I think it's, the thing that I love about it the most is that this is a story about slavery that doesn't let, that doesn't, it doesn't let white people off the hook. Um, and it's, because uh, I, 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 that's one of the things in, in slave stories that I always get frustrated with is, is that, you know, there has to be somebody that is living far beyond their time and and they're and they're they're yeah. they see the injustice and they take up the cause and they're the reason why change happens and you know it's that's just not the way it actually went down um you know there's a lot of people that there's definitely a lot of people of all races that contributed to the end of slavery but it's um you know this is i i i think that there, there needs to be some ownership of how monstrous it was and we need to face that down. And I think that um, this story does a good job of doing that. And my character Royal is actually uh, uh, a, a free man who our main character Cora meets on her journey uh, to, to freedom. And it's, um, it's uh, I, I don't want to say too much because I also think that, you know, it's like, hey, read the book. The book is in, it, it's incredible, um, but I also just want people to go on this journey, um, and um, it's it's because I think it'll be really worthwhile. And working with Barry Jenkins is the dream, and he's 
and you know he knows what he's doing and I think <laughs> going into going into this experience as open as you can is is really worthwhile so then working with material like that so heavy and deep how do you then shake it off as an actor at the end of the day how do you how are you able to come out of that and then go home or go out to eat like what is your process when you're working on material that's so heavy in that way what do you do to come out of it uh you know for me honestly i went to the gym a lot um that's okay. that's where i you know i just put on my headphones get in the gym and just you know just just sweat it out um there's also you know the thing about working on pieces like this i feel like our cast uh really did the best we could to keep it light when the cameras weren't rolling it's mm -hmm. you know it's it's just so because the subject matter is so intense it's not one of those where you ever find yourself mailing it in it's like something happens and it really just shocks your system and you go into this place mm -hmm. that you know it, you know it, it's it's not as necessary it, or i didn't feel it was as necessary for us to always just stay in this dark place right. you know the entire day it was like we're going to be in a really dark place in a few minutes while these cameras are rolling so right now let's you know make a joke break you know, or whatever let, let it go <laughs> for a little while or if you just need to stay quiet and take a walk do that right. um, mm -hmm. so it's uh it it, it was it, it's tough I, it, but uh, yeah i went to the gym a lot a lot and um you know it's just it's also i think that you know because of how sensitive the subject matter is um everyone was very kind on that set all the time mm -hmm. and i think that that allows you to feel safe in going where you need to go you know when you have you know a marauder doing some really nasty business but that would at the end of it be like you know that was great are you okay are we okay you know everyone was like very respectful and checking like, in on each other checking in and making sure that our heads were in the right place to do this as truthfully and as safely as we could mm -hmm. um and so it's I don't know. It was it was it was a huge learning experience for me because I I didn't know how I was going to be able to shake any of this off, and I think just being around the people that I was around for this process really helped. Wonderful. Well, everyone loves Chidi. Yes, everyone loves Chidi from the Good Place. And um, one thing that I learned that was really interesting is that you were actually ready to quit acting before you even landed the role. So I, I would love for you to share with everyone, um, you know, what was it that kept you motivated? How did you keep going? And, and what was that like to be at a point where you felt like you needed to do something else, but then ended up getting this role? Well, I, I think for me, I just sort of felt like I was on a treadmill. You know, I was running, but I wasn't getting anywhere. It felt like it. I mean, it wasn't entirely true. I mean, it's crazy the little narratives we spin in our head. Uh, especially when we're feeling down, but um, I have been doing a lot of theater and I've been working pretty consistently, but, you know, I was, look, I was, I was doing theater, so I was broke and I was in my mid thirties and, um, you know, living with several roommates and I, I, I just felt like, I'm like, dang, did I mess up? You know, <laughs> like I, I thought I was supposed to feel a little sure. more. You start to up. question your choices. Why did I do this? Like, and I, like, I thought I was supposed to be a real grown up by now, but I'm not, you know, and, you know, it's like I, because I was an actor, I missed a lot of really important moments in friends lives, you know, I, I couldn't like afford to get a plane ticket to go home for a friend's wedding and stuff like that. It was, you know, little things like that, that just sort of built up over time. And I realized that I was I don't know, I, I think I realized in the middle of a play that I just wasn't happy doing that play. And, you know, for the longest time, just getting to do the work was all that I needed. But mm -hmm. as I got older, I, I wanted more in my life than just, you know, chasing the next gig, getting that next gig, 
living hand to mouth and then being scared out of my mind if I, you know, for the, that I wouldn't get another gig. Yeah, because um, as you're working on something, you still have to think about, okay, I'm going to need to get something after this. Yeah, you got to secure that. Job. Yeah. So I was, uh, I was just, just worried all the time. And, um, and so I decided that I was just going to stop doing theater for a while and uh, focus on trying to get uh, uh, something on, on TV um, or film or something that would just give me a little bit of a cushion. Um, and I'd had some close calls before I had gotten close on some things that I was, I really wanted and they all fell apart. And, you know, so I was pretty broken, <laughs> you know, I was uh, pretty beat up. Um, and I remember I decided that I was going to come out to LA for a pilot season one more time. I was going to employ everybody that I could. I was going to get an agent, you know, my agent already had an agent, but I was going to need a manager and I was gonna, you know, go all hands on deck and just see if I can get something mm -hmm. um, and see if this is worth it. And if I got something great, and if I didn't, I was perfectly okay leaving this in, in the rear view for a while because I just wasn't happy, you know? And, um, and yeah, and then I just remember I had auditioned for The Good Place initially in New York before I went out to LA. I um, he did the first pre-read there and I, I didn't think that went well at all. It was just one of those things where the, the person I was auditioning with was reading in a very, with a, with a very different tempo from what I thought the scene was. And so I was just like, oh no, I, I'm, I'm blowing it. She's not doing it right. And you know, but it's like, I can't control what she does. You know, that's like, I, I love that you said that because I teach my students, when you are rehearsing your material on your own, you have to remain flexible as an actor because if you don't, then you are stuck in one way of giving, a, of giving that performance. And then you're also not able to really listen to direction and hear the feedback and be able to then make the adjustment and do it the very next time. And yeah. so I really love that you mentioned that because it's really important that you uh, I threw my students off today by telling them, okay, give me another way of doing this particular character. And, you know, it was the deer in the headlights kind of look because I throw them off intentionally in this auditioning class so that they don't have that experience of feeling like, oh, she wasn't supposed to read it like that. Or, oh, she's not looking at me or they're not giving me any energy. Yeah. Got to throw them off so that they're ready for whatever comes yeah, after. No, it's, it's so it's so true. You just you don't know what you're gonna get. Sometimes you, because the other thing is you can go in there sometimes and people can give you too much energy <laughs> and you're just like you're, you know you're just like stuck and just like my audition. Yeah. You're like yeah, it's like you are acting <laughs> hard right now. But um, yeah, so I but I just I remember thinking like ah oh, this isn't going the way I thought it was gonna go. You know it was fine, but I wasn't. I, I, I didn't feel like it was, this was it. And so anyway, I went out to LA and I heard that there was interest in that tape anyway. And then I went in and I auditioned for the entire team. And I remember before I got back to my car in the parking lot from that audition, they had called and said they wanted to test me. And, um, and so going into the test, it's like, that's a whole mind fuck too, because you're just, you, you sign this piece of paper that says for your life you this is what you're making this yeah is what you're making. and and you uh, see those numbers and you're like oh number. my car note my insurance yeah. your loans it's <laughs> all you know it's like, i can i need I, this i can do this and then you have to go in and just act like nothing's at stake you know you just go do your job and um and i remember going into the room Kristen bell was there i wasn't expecting her to be there and uh, you know, she's famous and I was not. So it was, I was, you know, intimidated, but you know, it was, it was a really relaxing thing because she was so kind and it was a, I just felt relaxed. And I think the thing that was really integral to that feeling of, of, of being relaxed in those rooms was that I was just like, look, I'm enjoying being in the room. I'm enjoying giving the performance you know, it, this may be the last time I do it. And if I get it, great. If I don't, okay. You know, I'm just here to, to do some work. And you let it and, go. And that, that then I, I got the job, which was great, you know. Um, so I think just that feeling of just letting it go. Um, yes. 
just 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 relaxing, being in the scene, looking to give the performance rather than to get a job, um, right. is that that really helped. And so, uh, yeah. And then just you know, it's just been four years of four years of just watching my life change quite a sure. bit. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, the one project I do want to ask you about, William Midsummer. <laughs> Sir. Yeah. Sir. Yeah. I, I don't even know what to say. I mean, it it wasn't scary, but it was just horrifying and creepy and just I don't want to go to any Scandinavian countries countries now. I mean, I, I am just like <laughs> I'm ruined. <laughs> So yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm just curious to know like, what was what was shooting it like, and you know what were the conditions like? Were, was there anything weird that may have happened on set? Because I was, I was really kind of creeped out after watching it. So I yeah. can't imagine what the experience was like shooting it. <laughs> it's uh, you know, it was. I don't know. I feel like the the cast that was playing the American characters. Mm -hmm. um, we were sort of kept off balance quite a bit. Um, uh, we had a pretty big Swedish cast and um, we were kept separate um, when, oh. and, and, and for a lot of it. Um, you know, it's not like, not like in that hardcore separation of like, you know, they, we never saw them unless they were on set, mm -hmm. but you know, they had their dressing area, we had ours. We would sometimes run into each other in the makeup trailer, um, but we were, yeah, we were kept off balance a lot. And I think that's sort of contributed to the sort of unsettled feeling that, that everybody had. Mm -hmm. um, but it was, uh, it was actually a, it was a pretty grueling shoot. It was, it was pretty tough. Um, I mean, it was, it was hot. We were just was in it? the field. Oh Lord, it was hot. We were, yeah, we were. Um, we shot in Budapest, or just outside okay. Budapest in Hungary, actually. And okay. uh, it was, it was sneaky hot. It was so hot. Um, <laughs> like, Where did the heat come from? <laughs> yeah, it's like it's just outside all day. There were just like crazy bugs and things all over the place. It was it probably was, bugs you've never even seen before. Yeah, because it's Hungary, <laughs> and um, and so like it was a. Uh, yeah, it was it was pretty it was pretty crazy. It was uh but it was it was fun watching how the brain of Ari Aster works cuz that dude's just sick. You know, <laughs> he's just a sick man. And um and so it was it was a, it was it was fun to see him get really excited about certain things. Mm -hmm. Hey Chico. Chico, uh, hey. Uh, yeah, he's he heard something. Um Anyway, so yeah, it was uh, it was really interesting to see the way his brain worked. But it was uh, yeah, it was a really intense shoot, and he's very meticulous about the shots. Mm -hmm. He's very meticulous about how things look, and so there would be times where we would spend all day on, you know, two three eighths of a page, um, wow. and that would it, it was it was it was it was it was a lot. It was a lot, but I think that the, the end result was something that was really grim and horrifying to a lot of people. I uh, loved it. And I, yeah, well, it's like, that's the thing. Like, people either love that movie or they hate it with their I whole I loved face. it. And I, I, I love it. I love the fact that there's people that are just like, I hate this movie with my neck, chest, and face, and other people that are like, All of me, but all great. of me. Yeah. <laughs> Well, um, I see that our students do have some questions, um, but first let's check in with our poll. All right, let's see. So the students responded that their favorite role of yours is, what is it? Hmm, let's see. It is, oh, The Good Place. No! <laughs> All right. That was a winner. <laughs> okay, Great. so uh, I will get to some of the questions. I will read them off. Let's see. Okay. 
So this question is from Aaron Donahue. For the role of Chidi, you played a character with extensive knowledge of philosophy. What kind of additional research did you do in the, uh, on the topic? And have you carried any of this with you since? Um, I, um, so here's the thing about philosophy is that it is dense and it is tough. And so I found that when I tried to just read some books or read a very uh, uh, academic article, I would get lost. So for me, for the, for the purpose of the show and for the purpose of the jokes that were going to come from the lessons that I was uh, teaching in the show, I would usually just go to Wikipedia <laughs> after, a certain moment, after a certain point. I would give it a shot if it was a particularly dense concept. I would give a scholarly article a shot and then I would find myself lost and basically go to Wikipedia where I got the Cliff's Notes version of the thing that they were trying to uh, explain. So, um, so yeah, it, th there's that. As far as like carrying things with me, um, you know, there's this one thing that Chidi says early on in the, uh, in the series, which is, uh, it's, it's something like, um, principles aren't principles when you pick and choose when to follow them. Ooh. And that's something that I've, held on to quite a bit, uh, especially in the last couple of years. Um, you know, there's been a couple of moments where I could abandon them and it would give me something in return, but, um, you know, I wasn't sure if I could look myself in, in the eye after that. And so I, uh, you know, I've, that's served me. It's actually helped me to live without certain regrets. Um, and so I, um, so I think that's the one thing that's like constantly sort of playing in my head. Okay. Uh, Kat Glazer, she says, representation is obviously super important. In what ways do you think new and upcoming writers, actors, and directors can best start changing the landscape of how Hollywood looks? Or is there even a best way? Oh God, I don't know. I don't know about, I mean, I, I, I just got to Hollywood. I don't know these That went heavy. <laughs> it's like, I just, I don't know them. Um, <laughs> no, like, I, I, I do feel like there, it, it really starts with thinking when it comes to character, when it, when I, I think there's a thing in Hollywood where we think of, we think of white as the default. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's something that can change. I think that there's a lot of, there's a lot of room for parts where race isn't germane to the part, uh, where, you know, it can just be, it can be anybody. And so, you know, I think that when something isn't, germane to the role. I think it's up to some of those gatekeepers and decision makers to, um, to, to, to sort of just like open up everything, you know? I think that the, right now, one of the things I see sometimes is casting directors will decide that this character is going to be a person of color, insert, uh, you know, group here. And I, I don't know that that's always the most useful way of looking at it. I think that sometimes it's just like, open it all up, you know, like, let's not, let's not just decide that these parts are, are for people of, uh, you know, a certain race or ethnicity or gender expression, you know, if it's not germane to the script, then let's just, let's just throw it all up and see what happens. And I think that we'll, we'll see more diversity that way. I think, I hope, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, I, but I, I just, I don't know. I feel like sometimes it's, we're going to plug these people into these places and I, I don't know if that's the, the most useful way of thinking of it sometimes. Sure. Um, Samantha, uh, let's see, she says, you spoke about the difference in prep for stage and screen and how the work gets, quote, in your bones. Do you find that there is less room for improvisation and screen work because of this? Uh, actually, no. I find that um, when I'm on stage, I am pretty much word perfect all the time. Unless I'm, unless I just, you know, 
don't know it. You know, <laughs> it's like there's definitely times I've been on stage underprepared, but uh, typically on stage, you're, you're, when you're going through that process, the writer is very meticulously crafting that play right up until you get out of previews. Mm -hmm. And so if that's the case, then, you know, you, you really want to hold, hold to that because it's sort of being made around what your natural rhythms are in a way anyway. Mm -hmm. But like, um, I think that for me on camera, it's, um, there's a lot of little improvisations that happen. There's a lot of little, ads here and there that happen for a lot of actors that just sort of smooth things out. Um, generally, I find that scripts on TV um, in particular are written very quickly, which means that there's certain things that are really tough to get your, your, your mouth around. And the writer will see that and be like, you know, just make it easier for yourself to say this or just like, you know, if you need something to massage it, go ahead and do that. And sure. they'll let you do it, you know, because it's sort of a thing where it's, because the turnaround is so quick, you know, they're, they're sort of like, let's, uh, yeah, like there, it, there's a little more room for that. So um, for me, I've done more improvising that has actually made it into the actual rendering of the thing on screen than there has been on stage for me. But you, and, but at the end of the day, you always want to respect the writer's words because just as you said, they've been living in it for so long. They, they have their own rhythm that they've created. And so you always want to respect what they've written. Yeah, well, yeah, it's like, it's the thing where you don't want to start out being like, I don't want to say it like that when you haven't given it a try. Like okay. that, you can, don't do that. <laughs> you know, it's like, if there's a way that, there might be a there might be a clue in there in in the way the words are laid out that tells you what you, where you are and what you're doing and what you want and you know it's like sometimes if you connect to it that way it'll open up the scene for you if you commit to it and sometimes you'll commit to it and the writer will be behind the monitor and be like oh that's not doing what i thought it was going to do hey Let's try something else. There's something else you want to do. I feel it. I feel that you want to try something there. So why don't you try this? And, and then that's when it's okay to do it. I, but you definitely don't want to start out from a place of no. That's not, that's not the way to make, for me, I don't think that's the way to make art. Sure. Well, here at SCAD, we prepare our students for creative professions. And one of the things that we encourage our students to do is to identify mentors for themselves. So who are some of your industry mentors? Hmm. Um, yeah, there's a few. Um, there's this actor who I, uh, I remember reading a play that he did off Broadway in New York uh, before I went to school. And, um, his, his, and then I actually wound up doing a couple of different projects with him. I was actually in All the Way with him and we shared a dressing room. Okay. Uh, and so that was really cool. His name is Peter J. Fernandez. And he's one of these actors that's, you, he's one of those actors that pops up all over the place. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, he's also done some series and things like that, but he's, you know, primarily a stage guy. And uh, it was, I, I sort of looked to him for, um, you know, especially as things were career-wise starting to kick off for me, he was one of those people that I could like pick his brain about how to approach certain things and you know what's a good way of looking at stuff and 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 so like I I, I he's one of those guys for me um, and there's there's so many more I just I'm on the <laughs> spot so I'm like, I can't, I guess it's like man. but that's the first name that jumps to mind. Uh, okay, well, one last fun question. What is the craziest fan experience you've had? Because uh, there was a lot of talk about Chidi and the arms and having the shirt off and the whole thing. Has anything, any, anything really crazy ever happened, like a really crazy fan experience that you've had? Um, no, you know, fortunately, you know, most of our fans, they, they, they love the show, but they're, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're fine. They're respectful. I, I did have a really interesting experience one time. I, I, I remember, um, 
And I just found it odd. It, it wasn't really frightening or anything like that. But I do remember I, we were in Paris shooting the finale. And uh, I remember uh, my girlfriend and I were getting on the train to get back to our hotel. And this, this woman who lives in Paris came up and was like, oh my God, are you, are you cheaty? And I was like, oh, um, I mean, I'm, yeah, I will. Yeah. And she was like, oh, oh my God. Like, yeah, you guys are, <laughs> yeah, like you guys are, you guys are shooting here, right? Yeah. You guys are shooting on the, at the bridge tomorrow. Right. And I was like, uh, oh, I mean, I, yeah, yeah. Are, are you, are you, are you working? I thought she was like one of the crew. She's like, oh, no, I saying I just, this to you? <laughs> yeah. And she was like, no, I just, I just know you'll see me. I'll see you tomorrow. And I was like, oh, 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 you know, which was, you know, strange. And sure enough, <laughs> we were uh, wrapping up. We were shooting the last uh, scene of the series, actually. And she was there. And, you know, not, like nothing, like there was nothing wrong with her. There was nothing like, like creepy or anything. But I just, I, I, it was one of those things where like, we were very secretive about all of our locations and everything. And I don't know how she found out where we were going to be. Right. And that we were in Paris at all, you know. Uh, so uh, that was that was like, the, you know, the to have someone know where you're going to be when you're overseas is something that's just sort of like a real mind. Disconcerting. Thing. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I'm not even at home, you know. Like, it's, it's, it's just, I don't know, it's weird when it's ha when it happens in Paris, I guess. Definitely. Uh, yeah. Well, a couple of people have mentioned that they would love to see Chico. Is Chico around before we say goodbye? Oh, yeah. Chico, come here. You want to come over here? You want to come over here? Chico, come. Yeah, no, he's just looking at me. He's like, he's like, he's, he's in his son's spot. And he just looks confused. I think I can, let's see. Can I get him to come over? Can you get, want to come? No? Come on, buddy. Come. Come on. Come on. Come on. Oh, Lord. He, my girlfriend's in, involved. He's, he, so he's, he's like, we're playing. All of us are playing. You want to come up? Yeah, I'm not feeling it. He doesn't know what to do. He's First you put me in a crazy t-shirt, <laughs> then you do all these other things. <laughs> oh God, he was not having that shirt. <laughs> but I mean like, yeah, he thinks we're getting ready to play. He's, he's like, yeah, he's looking my girlfriend in the face and he's running laps. Well, that's I don't awesome. Know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't he's in a good mood. <laughs> Well, I just want to thank you again for taking the time to be here with us and sharing all of your experiences and wisdom. And I want to thank everyone here in the virtual audience for being with us as well. Please join us on Wednesday, September 30th at 9 a.m. when we will be discussing Changing the World with Cyber Texture Architect and Technologist James Law. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you again for being with us. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.